I've been a lifelong activist. When I was 13 years old, I did my first campaign, which was I refused to stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I was kicked off my graduation field trip. And basically every year since then, I would research some sort of aspect. So one year I did a, you know, an unauthorized underground student newspaper and got suspended from school. And one year I went to um, Palestine, did direct action nonviolence and all this kind of stuff. So every year I did more and more activism until ultimately at the age of 28 was working for a magazine called Adbusters in Canada. And we came up with the idea for Occupy Wall Street. That movement spread to 82 countries, almost a thousand cities, and it was a tremendous in many ways, and it was amazing. But in the kind of failure and collapse of Occupy Wall Street, I found myself wondering, like, why didn't it work? You know, instead of trying to see Occupy Wall Street as a success, I wanted to understand, well, why did it fail? Because I actually believed, I think a lot of us believed in 2011, that we were going to see the kind of dramatic social transformations that were sweeping across the Arab world. We were going to see, you know, Obama change the law and money in politics or, or see Obama overthrown like Mubarak was overthrown. You know, we had these unrealistic ideas. But, you know, the thing about Occupy Wall Street is in many ways it was the paradigm of the perfect social movement. So I wanted to understand, well, why did this, this perfect social movement, a social movement that was nonviolent, that spread everywhere, involved lots of people, why didn't it work? So in the immediate years after Occupy Wall Street, the first kind of understanding and theory that I, that I kind of came to is that Occupy failed because it was, it was pursuing a broken theory of change. We had been acting as if, if you, you know, as, as if, if you just get enough people into the streets, largely nonviolent, unified behind a message, that change will happen. And I think a lot of the reason why we believe this is because one of the core myths animating democracy, which is written into the Declaration of Independence, which is written into the UN Declaration of Human Rights, is the idea that the authority of our governments derives from the consent of the governed. So as activists, if we want to change our governments, we have to prove that the people don't agree with what the government is doing. And so it made a lot of sense in terms of activism to try to, to show that discontent. One of the things that we learned is that, no, this, this isn't true. Um, that, that governments are no longer dependent upon um, the consent of the governed, that actually governments can do whatever they want in between elections, basically. We put an overemphasis on street actions, on what I call voluntarist behaviors, getting large numbers of people to do collective behaviors together, and we kind of neglected some of the other aspects of change, like the structural forces, the, um, the spiritual forces, and the subjective forces. And this, is, this was the main content of my book, The End of Protest. This is where I mainly focused. But lately I've started to see that there's also other reasons why Occupy and the subsequent movements have failed. And they are basically a broken strategy and a broken activist culture. So when I talk about activist culture being broken, what I'm trying to refer to, what I'm trying to think about is first this question of what is it that makes effective activists? If we think about someone like, you know, like Evan Wolfson or Martin Luther King or these people who basically they identified something in their world that they wanted to change, and they, and they pursued a strategy to change it. There's also something that was, which is really important, which is that they had to overcome the tremendous amount of resistance from everyone around them, telling them that they were wrong. So not only did they, were they being told from, by people who were not sympathetic to the cause of, for example, desegregation, that they were wrong, but they were told by people who were sympathetic to the desegregation cause that they are wrong. And so this is most famously Martin Luther King's letter in, from a Birmingham jail, where he talks explicitly about white liberals telling him he shouldn't be doing civil disobedience, that civil disobedience is wrong. Why was someone like Martin Luther King able to persist even though the movement told him he was wrong? This is what concerns me, is that I think that activist culture today is losing that capacity to step outside of the movement. Partly we are, we have become overly susceptible to believing that the movement consensus is right. And so we don't want to break consensus. So if the movement says, for example, with Occupy Wall Street, the movement said, okay, let's have a May Day general strike, which objectively was a terrible strategy, but there was no, very few people were willing to resist that. The future of activism and, and the creation of effective forms of activism are dependent on creating characters who are able to resist the tremendous pressure to conform. And this, I think, is something that right now is is lacking, you know, and I and one of the ways I kind of see this, you know, at activist graduate school, we have been focusing up until now almost exclusively on one aspect of pedagogy, which is the higher learning. So we are we are our mission, our our explicit mission is to provide the highest quality education, the highest level of thinking about activism. But there's a whole other component, which is this component of character development. How do you create people who can resist the pressure to conform? 
one answer to what the future of activism is, is is a return to a kind of deep thinking about pedagogy, but also specifically around this question of what is it that we need to be doing to train activists to resist activism? What do we need to do in order to, to use the tools of activism against activism? There's been a growth of like kind of a activist industry, an industry that is promoting one vision of activism that is not designed to create radical and revolutionary social change. That's, that's explicitly not there not their goal. Their goal might be to influence the way that we live or to reform the society in which we live, but they're not trying to create like a fundamental revolutionary transformation, which is what the goal of activism I think should and was supposed to be. And so one of the ways that that's playing out though is the creation of, of the mainstreaming of activist culture um, in ways that promote conformity of thought. And so this is, I think, one of the things that I find very potentially troubling. And I think that this really came up a lot in the for example, the UCLA class on the housing justice activism, is that a lot of students who were doing the best, quote unquote, the best work, you know, when you looked at their campaign plans, it was the most articulated, the most thought out, the most um, nuanced and sophisticated. They themselves would write in there, oh, these ideas are not my own. They're the, they're the ideas of the movement. And this to me, I said to them, is, this, is, this, is, this is complete bunk. You know, because if you had talked to the gay rights movement in 1983 and said, write down the campaign strategy that's going to bring us success, they would have been pointing in the completely the wrong direction. That's the whole point of Evan Wolfson's story. So we need to create people who are able to, um, who, who are dedicated to creating change on progressive issues, leftist issues, but in a way that stands apart from the left, apart from progressives. This presents a whole bunch of challenges, funding challenges and social support challenges and, iso you know, feeling isolated. The pressure to conform within activism is one of the reasons, if not the main reason, why our social movements are failing. I think that we need to somehow create some sort of way of rewarding the outsiders, rewarding the eccentrics, rewarding the moonshots, not just all pursuing the same strategy, not thinking that coalitioning is going to help or work or be better. This is one of the, the core orthodoxies that we subscribe to, is we think that if we work together, we will create change. It makes perfect sense, but it's not, it doesn't actually seem to be true. In fact, it seems like that, that dramatic social change seems to be achieved by, by outsider ideas that all of a sudden start to work. And so this is one of the challenges, is how are we going to change activist culture? And, this, and I think this can only be achieved by activism against activism. We can't change activist culture by standing outside of it. Like, obviously, there are lots of people who are opposed to activism because they don't agree with activism. But we need to be the people who are changing activism because we precisely do agree with activism, that we want it to be more effective. Um, and so I think a lot of the work that I was doing after Occupy Wall Street was first just raising the question of like, are we even winning? You know, is this success? The Women's March gets 1.5% of the population to protest in the streets on a single day. That's, in, that's insane, 1.5. But is that winning? Is that success? And I think that it's not. It's not winning and it's not success. Um, and I think that in order to figure out what winning and what success looks like, we have to go back to this question of pedagogy. We have to go back to this question of character development. We have to go back to this question of like, how do we, how do we create activists and can we create activists?